Hello and welcome to our webinar, Design Considerations to Successfully Manufacture Complex Overmolds, featuring our speakers, John Sidorowitz, our VP of Sales, and Glenn Miller, a tooling engineer. My name is Mark Strobel, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Eccentric. This presentation is expected to last about 30 minutes. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can use the questions field on your screen to ask questions during the presentation, and we will address these at the end of the webinar. We encourage you to follow Eccentric Mold and Engineering on LinkedIn so that you can stay up to date on our latest blog topics and webinar schedules. I now turn it over to our keynote speakers, John and Glenn. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon or, or morning, wherever you're at. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is John Sterowitz. I'm the VP of Inside Sales here at Eccentric. Glenn? Glenn Miller, <clears throat> tooling engineer here at Eccentric. All right, so we'll get started. And as Mark said, you know, during the process, um, feel free to um, submit questions, and uh, we'll get to those at the end here. So without further ado, let's get started. So kind of our key discussion points for today, um, when do you choose injection molding? Um, and then just kind of go over the basics of overmolding and things to design or things to consider when you're doing your designs for overmolding. Uh, material selections, surface finishes, and then final file requirements for quoting. Um, so when do you choose injection molding? Um, it's really going to be based on your, your materials, the size of your part, the complexity of the part, kind of what you are doing. Um, so if you have an application that requires some sort of plastic, specifically a thermoplastic or a thermoset material that uh, needs to be molded, um, Injection molding can range from micro molded parts up to very, very large parts. Um, think of car parts, dashboards, those types of things. Um, and with the complexity, it's nearly limitless um, with injection molding. Um, and with that, you can do multiple tic or textures, materials, uh, finishes, polishes, um, painting. And all that. Yeah, various various <clears throat> features, details can be formed. The open and shut, slide action, any type of uh, core poles, various things, threads. There's there's no limit really to what can be done with an injection mold. And with the economics of injection molding, you've got um, you can range from prototype um, like 3D printed molds through aluminum soft tooling all the way up to production full on you know P20 um, tooling. So depending where you're at within your project, you can get injection molding done um, in, in pretty much those three areas. So the basics of overmolding, you know, here internally, um, and for the most part, um, your first shot, or your base part is going to be your substrate. <clears throat> and then from there, we that is loaded into, you know, another mold where it's the second shot or the overmold is done. And, and what's the end result is, is the assembly of the part. So and as we go through uh, the presentation today, just, you know, we're going to mention substrate and overmold uh, quite a bit. So just kind of remember what the, what those mean. And, um, yeah. Okay, so reasons to overmold. Um, there's many reasons why you would want to overmold something, add aesthetically pleasing color contrast to your parts. If you look over to the right there, you've got a, you have a piece with a, a bit of a grip feature added to it that was in a different color, a different texture. Um, you add flexibility to rigid part areas. Um, you can eliminate a, a great deal of assembly and secondary operations. If these pieces are molded together, they're ready to go, and that doesn't have to be done on a secondary operation. And, and obviously, again, uh, you capture uh, one part inside of another without actually gluing or having to fasten them in some other uh, way. And that's a good example to the right there. So some of the things to consider when um, when thinking about overmolding. So uh, material uh, is big. Uh, you want to have materials that are compatible with each other that can be you know molded together. Um, in design as well, um, how the how the two parts are going to work together, uh, and what that outcome is going to be. Surface finishes, and then uh, you know file requirements for for mold design uh, for any manufacturer. 
Yeah, material selection, uh, it's, this is something that it really needs to be addressed way up front at the beginning of a project, uh, get the proper um, resin manufacturers and technicians involved as well. Uh, you know, substrate materials, the preferred for, for good bond and adhesion, you got your ABSs, PC ABS, PCs, and uh, a few of the nylons. Um, what you need to avoid whenever possible, whenever your design dictates, you know, polypropylenes, any of the high, high density or low density polyethylenes and any kind of acetal material. Um, your, your second shot, which is the overmold piece itself, um, again, you need to research that and get a, a resin manufacturer and technician involved. There needs to be a, a, a appropriate chemical bond between the two materials. And the reason to, to kind of avoid those materials where possible, there's a little footnote at the bottom of the page there, just some some materials naturally are, are lubricated, uh, kind of like an, like an acetal. So it's difficult to adhere uh, a second material on top of that. You just won't get good adhesion. So, I mean, one of the first design considerations is, is wall thickness. And this is just going to go with any injection molded part um, not being even over molded. So, uh, the best practice is always to ensure a, a consistent nominal wall throughout the part. And this is going to, you know, apply to both the substrate and uh, the overmold. So the, the reasons for this, it's going to allow for adequate flow of material when it's being molded. Um, it's going to help with uniform shrinkage of the part uh, as the part cools when it comes out of the mold. If you have too many, you know, thick, thin uh, wall transitions or thick sections in a part, it can lead to abnormal shrink, um, which can affect the overmold later on, which we'll touch on. So, you know, when when picking materials, or once you have your materials picked, it's we always want to look at the minimum, meaning at least the minimum requirements uh, for the design, because some materials will have certain minimum wall thicknesses that you'll need to uh, adhere to in order to fill. Right, and as John said, and this this is kind of a rule of thumb for just standard injection molding parts and certainly over molded parts. Um, anytime you can make that a wall, that wall thickness of your part nominal um, without a lot of uh, areas that pinch down, anytime that plastic flows through, it wants to flow freely. Anytime it hits an area like that, it'll basically dam up and, and create an issue where you won't fill the part evenly. And as John said, you'll, you'll have issues like shrink, uh, sink marks, flash in one area and so forth and so on. So again, when you're designing your parts, always keep in mind that when possible, maintain nominal wall thickness and uh, nice fluid transitions through the part, through the different details and so forth. Uh, some of the design considerations, um, we're looking at uh, some radii here. Uh, best practice, obviously you wanna have consistency. Um, if you look at it this way, any kind of sharp corner uh, can create an issue for the plastic. Plastic does not like sharp corners, does not like thin areas. Anytime you can have a nice smooth transitional area, always better whether that's a radius or, or some type of uh, flow or transitional uh, angle area. Um, you just don't want to inhibit the flow of the material itself. And that's just as important in normal injection molding uh, very important in overmolding as well, especially since you're flowing over a actual <laughs> plastic part as part of the overmold tool. That uh, substrate part uh, in many areas will be shutting off on the steel of the actual tool itself. So again, anywhere where you can make sure that you're not having any tight areas, corners, and things like that, it will definitely help the process on our end and the design. Yeah, and if you're not sure if you've got a part design and you're not really sure how it's going to fill, um, I mean, you can reach out to us or whoever's manufacturing the part and see if they can do a, a DFM or a mold flow analysis to, uh, to see if there's going to be any potential issues. Um, the next design consideration is, you know, kind of gate locations. Um, so. Uh, the gate is the point of entry from plastic uh, entering the part within the mold. So there is going to be a, a gate vestige or a, a gate scar or of some sort 
uh, that's going to be visible somewhere on the part. Uh, typically, when you're over molding the substrate, the gate location is usually covered at that point. Um, but this is more focused on the uh, the overmold uh, part. So the the big thing you want to do is try to hide those gates or make use of um, mechanical holds that are within the within the part. So for example, this uh, image here on the right, um, we have this kind of through hole that's in the substrate. So the the black part is the substrate, the red is the overmold. And we would gate through the inside of the, the substrate part on the core side and feed material to the outside of the part. This would um, hide the gate on the inside of the part and give a nice clean finish on the outside. And, and it also provides a kind of a mechanical lock between the two uh, different materials. And throughout your part design, it's also, I know we'll go through that, but also good to have uh, holes and locking features within that plastic to give that overmold material some place to flow into and grip. Yeah, and just kind of referring back to one of the samples earlier, that round knob, it had a, you know, well, we can kind of go back to it. So you can see it's got a bunch of, you know, through holes and, and kind of holes throughout the outside. You know, that was for material to flow through and actually uh, lock onto that substrate. So in this case, there's the mechanical hold, and then you've got the chemical bond between the two materials, which is what you really really want um, it's going to prevent that part from peeling off that knob right you're going to want both if you can possibly manage it you know you're obviously going to have some <clears throat> chemical adhesion but anytime you can add in those mechanical locking features uh, even better uh, we've got uh, the next slide here is showing some uh, design considerations for various shutoffs uh, basically the shutoff is where the, the plastic um, of the substrate shuts off on the steel for the overmold uh, tool. And obviously, plastic and steel are two different materials, but as long as you have um, good recesses in, in areas for a nice hard shutoff, there's various uh, ways to do that down at the bottom of the page there. Um, the shutoff just ensures that you're going to get a nice clean edge. Um, what you don't want is any material flashing over. That would be a peel-off point for that material. Um, you know, the first image, you've got a nice hard shutoff with a, with a nice sharp edge. Uh, the second image shows a groove actually inside of the substrate material so that the red overmold material can flow down into it and lock on. And then that last image is, is showing a little more basic image with a, a kind of a groove into the substrate material. And there, where that arrow is pointing, is where the steel is going to come down and shut off on that and basically lock into that substrate material and then provide you that nice red uh, <laughs> over mold look. Um, next, we have is, you know, when thinking about your substrate. Um, so it, it's, you know, the substrate's a part within itself. So uh, the biggest thing is going to be consistency part to part. Um, you know, the way we do our overmolds here, it's, it's transfer. So we, we shoot the first shot in one mold and then take that part and move it to another. Uh, in the traditional two-shot method, it's, you know, it, the, the mold rotates and, and you get your second shot. But um, consistency, you know, with the substrate is, is highly important. Um, and that's the and the biggest driver of that is the overall part design and, and mainly the consistent wall thickness and nominal wall thickness. Um, when you start getting into abnormal shrink and um, things start moving around, that can affect all your shutoffs uh, within the overmold tool and, and create molding issues. Right. I mean, if you can imagine, um, you have that substrate piece that's molded, that's pulled out of the tool. That substrate piece is then taken by our tool uh shop and that it has to be fit exactly into that overmold so as john said there needs to be very consistent uh output from that initial <clears throat> substrate tool you, you can't have a lot of variance between the shrink the fill any of those things because once that substrate gets put into the overmold it has to shut off perfectly and tight um 
and once you have a piece that goes in there that's a little small, there's a little abnormal shrink, the overmold's gonna flash and you're gonna have a mess on your hands. So again, um, when you're molding the substrate pieces, we always look for the most consistent possible fill across all of the pieces so that when we do run the overmold, you're gonna get a nice consistent fill and nice sharp edges and clean lines and so forth. So now we're on to surface finishes. Um, so with, with your substrates, our, our standard finish is a V3 finish. It's basically machine, or all the machine marks removed. Um, if the part's being overmolded, we you know push for you know a light to medium blast in those areas. And what that's going to do is promote a better bonding between the substrate and overmold, especially when dealing with uh, with rubber materials. It just gives more surface area. Um, in regards to the overmolding. Again, this is really going to depend on the material, that second shot. Is it a rubber? Is it, um, you know, another rigid plastic? Um, if it's going to be a rubber type material like a TPE, TPU, uh, probably want to stay away from polish. It, the polish doesn't take well to those materials anyway. And in addition, if we do, it can cause the part to stick within the mold. Absolutely. So we've got a few part examples here uh, of some over molds and um, actually two and we'll kind of go through um, this one we had to go through and, and make some changes. So the part initially came over, the gray area is the over mold, the, the green is the substrate. Mm -hmm. um, the material that was chosen for the over mold, um, it would not fill. Um, the area was just too thin, it was almost like skinning over. Um, it was for an aesthetic look. Um, and what we had to do was on this next slide here, a uh, customer had to basically remove some of the substrate um, and basically drop that so we could add material to uh, to the overmold in order to get that fill. Right, you just want a thickening of that area to, to actually provide a, a flow of that material across there. So I don't, I don't know how much we had actually had to have that uh, opened up, but it was substantial. It was very thin at first, so yeah, um, and that can be done obviously. But you want to you want to look at that and, and have that figured out uh, really for prior to actually building the tool. And then we can go back in and change things obviously if we have a fill issue. But you really need to look at that as John said. Make sure that you have a nice nice wall thickness there for a good material flow. And you can see, well, you may or may not be able to, but there's actually a, a channel that runs up around the outside. If you look to the left where the recess starts, it's actually a little bit lower, and that channel kind of runs around and, and helps, um, you know, with the, the flow of material and more surface area for that overmold to uh, to grab. As well as off to the right, you see kind of three, uh, three holes through the, the substrate, which, again, that was to feed material through uh, for gating and for mechanical holds. Next here we have an example of kind of a double overmold. Um, so we have the, the green body uh, and the, the blue button, which those were, were molded independently and then loaded into a tool and then overmolded together to make an assembly. Uh, and then it ended up being an actuating button in the center of this uh, this housing. Yes, yeah, so if you imagine that red material is a is a rubber material, as John said, and that button pushes in, and it provides like a gasket feature, and kind of uh, fills that out and makes it watertight, sealed area, so that there's no uh, contaminants that go into this particular uh, assembly. So, when quoting, um, I mean, this should be common among most manufacturers. Uh, when quoting an overmold, overmolded part, um, they'll need a substrate file, an overmold file, and an assembly file with separate bodies within there. That's just going to allow uh, us or, or them to really see what's going on um, and, and make sure that it's, it's going to be possible to, to get what you're looking for. Um, so in summary, evaluate your materials, um, check data sheets, start there. And then you can go into your designs. Get your get your uh, material reps involved. Get your technicians involved to help you out with that. Uh, any any input from them will definitely help you make your decisions. Uh, the other next is uh, as we said, you got to treat the overmold as a separate piece. 
maintain nominal wall thickness whenever possible, um, radii for good material flow, um, uh, put in uh, design flow channels and, and holds into your part, whether that be holes or ribs or any of that, um, grooves. I and mean, make sure we have some nice hard shutoffs. We showed you those three examples uh, of different ways to do that. Um, for sticking issues, um, we, we do a B3 finish and uh, maybe a, a slight vapor blast, maybe a light blast on that. Uh, that'll keep the part from sticking. Um, and again, like John said, you need your three separate files to do a quote. Uh, your main assembly file with everything in place with different bodies, obviously, and separate files for both the substrate and a separate file for the overmold. All right, folks, so that, uh, that wraps up the presentation portion of uh, the webinar. Um, if you have questions, please enter them into uh, the chat window uh, in, in, your, uh, in your dashboard. Um, we do have several questions already, so uh, John, why don't you go ahead and just go from the top. Okay. Uh, in slide 11, what is an example of a bad shutoff? Glenn, what would be a good example of a bad shutoff? I mean, a bad shutoff, I mean, if you're looking at that first window where you've got a nice sharp edge where that wall thickness, once the overmold is complete, it's kind of a, a nominal. Having a step. If you had some sort of step there, uh, that would create an area where there would be kind of a vertical uh, shutoff in the cavity of the overmold. Um, you kind of want to try to avoid that. What you want to do is something more to the next slide over where you've got a groove in the substrate and then a nice hard shutoff into the cavity. Um, there, there are many areas that we could point out on a specific part. If you had an, uh, a file for us, we could look at that, uh, kind of do a preemptive uh, DFM and, and look at areas that we thought were an issue and could give you some uh, some ideas on uh, how to make an adjustment to that if necessary. Okay. Um, are the slides going to be available? Yes. Yes, the, the slides will be available as will they record it. Okay. Uh, do you ever do you liquid silicone overmolding? Uh, no, we do not. Um, in your Button example, can you talk about how you shut off uh, shut off the mold for the second shot? So how do you shut off the mold? Well, basically what you're seeing there, the, the red area is the <clears throat> overmolded part of this assembly. Um, so directly beneath that and surrounding that blue area, there would be tool steel there obviously shutting off only on the end, edges of that green piece from either end and also around the blue piece that's hanging down that rectangular section. The entire cavity would have the entire shape of the green and the blue and then there would be a ring around where that red goes through there. There would be a shutoff there between the green and the blue. There would be a, a rib of steel that would go around there and shut that off and then the material would flow in between that and fill out the red area. So again, like we were talking about before, your substrate pieces during the overmold process are literally part of the overmold tool and part of the shutoff itself. So again, this is why you need to take some consideration on what type of materials you're going to use and so forth, because that plastic piece for the substrates will be part of what shuts off on that tool as well. Um. Can you go into detail draft angles and such on the three types of shutoffs? I mean, draft angles in general, as a as a mold designer or a mold builder, uh, we'll we'll always ask for as much possible draft as possible. Um, what you're seeing here, if you look at the center image, it, it does look like we're looking at a completely vertical wall there. Um, we would require some amount of draft depending on the material itself, depending on the uh, uh, actual texture and polish required for the piece. Again, whether that's a quarter degree, one degree, five degrees, uh, it really depends on uh, varying factors, whether it be the texture of the material um, that's applied to the tool. Uh, vertical walls are a no-no. Um, that causes all sorts of issues with sticking, uh, and so forth. So anytime you can add a draft 
uh, the, the more the better. We realize your application doesn't always allow for that, but there needs to be some amount of draft on these to allow for the function of the actual tool. Okay, it looks like we got time for maybe one or two more. Um, a little more about gate locations would be super helpful. Um, I mean, that's going to be difficult to, to kind of answer because it's really going to depend on part design. Um, if you've got a design that you're working on right now or potentially, uh, you can give us a call and uh, you know, we can definitely give you feedback and, and, and see what's going to be uh, available for that um, or what we could do. I mean, for the substrates themselves, as John mentioned before, um, those subs, subs, uh, subgates, uh, any kind of gate area, any of that vestige um, can be designed in a way that will be covered during the overmold process. The, now on the overmold side, um, again, we're looking at uh, areas in the substrate that have through holes or other features where the gating can go through. Um, again, that's going to be uh, an opening on the substrate itself. Um, and that really comes down to your assembly and your design and what you can have for an actual vestige. Depends on the material itself as well, whether it can be clipped off clean. Um, it, it really does come down to your, your exact uh, project. So anytime you can give, the, give us that material up, up ahead, we can take a look at it and provide you with a little feedback on that. Okay. Um, next question, what kind of chemical bond can be used? Can you give some examples? So. When we talk of chemical bond, um, there are materials specifically made to bond with um, certain materials. So, uh, for example, you have a PCABS substrate and you want to have a TPE, TPU overmold. There are specific materials that are, are made um, that for overmolding and bonding to uh, PCABS. So there is no additional, you know, like a bonding agent or, or anything that needs to be put on the, the substrate in order to create that chemical bond. And that's where you want to get your, your, uh, your resin and the material technicians involved because they have a uh, vast knowledge of, of what materials bond with, with what and, and what would work good for your application. So you want to get them up, involved up front. All right, we'll take this last one here. If you're having an overmolded part that completely encompasses the substrate on the outside, how do you compensate for the shrink of the overmold as it's being restrained by the substrate? Um, the shrink, I mean, again, you're, you're creating a tool that's going to have that substrate basically trapped on the inside. Now, one thing you're going to have to think about, we can't just lay that substrate into that tool. There's going to have to be something, some sort of standoff, some sort of pin feature, something to lock that in place so that when the material flows into that uh, cavity, it's not going to force that substrate down or away and create some thin areas and so forth. So uh, again, uh, as far as the shrink rate is concerned, um, you're going to get what you have in your actual design that's going to be machined directly into that overmold. So but you do have to make sure that, that somehow that that substrate piece can be locked in place and held, whether that means pins uh, from either side or both standoffs. sides better, uh, a standoff rib feature that that can be laid into. Um, more times than not, there's going to have to be some type of opening or hole in your finished product so that you can have those standoffs and, and features in there to hold it in place. Again, we can look at that and go over that with you in, in detail and uh, kind of guide you on how to maintain that. Folks, that's going to wrap up our webinar for the day. We, we thank you for joining us. Uh, and again, if you've got sp questions specific to your project, please do contact us. We are happy to, to walk through your project with you. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.